Okay, so we're moving into chapter 13 now, and now we are getting solidly into 20th century experimental psychology. Um, we're going to have a little bit of late 1800s stuff, but for the most part, we're going to be talking about things that are going to be hopefully a lot more familiar to you now uh, within the domain of, of uh, actual psychology stuff that you would have encountered most likely in the psych of learning class. But we're going to look at some of the foundational stuff here too. So actually, let's do that. Let's back up some and focus on some underlying philosophy. But this is a review. We've already talked about Descartes, but we didn't talk much about this aspect of, of Cartesian philosophy. So if you recall, he was a dualist and he had this idea of a mechanistic mind-body interaction where he has the stuff of mind and the stuff of body defined in ways that are completely opposites of each other. And then he also has this mechanistic idea of how the body works in terms of the animal spirits flowing through the nerves and that it's the mind inside the pineal gland that actually can, can trigger this process and determine uh, through free will where the animal spirits go and therefore that's determining the movements of the body uh, in a freely chosen way. But one of the things that we didn't get into a lot of detail about was that he also had an explanation of, of animal behavior. One of the things that we mentioned was that Descartes thought the pineal gland was special because he thought that it was only found in the human brain and not in animal brains. And this was, of course, a mistake because it's very small and difficult to find. So in the animal specimens that he studied, he didn't find it, but it was still there. But nevertheless, based on his, his, his observation, he was led to the conclusion that animals do not have a mind. They don't have reason and logic and free will. And therefore, animal behavior would be more mindless and robotic. He saw them as an automaton, right? Automatic behavior. And so how does animal behavior work without a ghost in the machine, right? The pineal gland. And his argument is that what would happen is that a sensory uh, stimulus would activate one of the sensory organs and that would force the flow of animal spirits through the sensory nerves, which would then go to the brain and then would automatically turn around and be pushed out through the motor nerves, which would then control the body. And this was just an automatic process. It's basically stimulus in, response out. Um, so it's mechanically the same process that, that is happening in the human body. It's just that humans have the ghost in the machine that, are, that, that enable us to have some sort of free will and conscious choice about how, the, how we respond to a stimulus. Whereas animal behaviors, it becomes more of an automatic, mindless res uh, response to a stimulus. So in the old Cartesian view, this creates essentially two psychologies, right? You have a human psychology, which involves the special mind and free will, and then you have an animal psychology without that. So here we have this discontinuity. One of the things then that makes Darwin's ideas important, and we've already reviewed some of the implications of Darwinian theory back in chapter 11, uh, which is that it eliminates that human-animal uh, uh, dichotomy, right? It places human biology into the same domain as animal biology, and it enables us to start seriously having a discussion about what we will call comparative biology. That is, the basic structures and mechanisms and physiology of the human body are the same as with other animal species, especially other warm-blooded mammals, right? So doing comparative anatomy with the cardiovascular system and, the, and all of that sort of stuff is all makes sense from that perspective. But of course, it also makes sense that if we're going to start saying that uh, we're going to also allow a, a comparative uh, neuroscience, that the principles that operate within the nervous system are the same in humans as they are in other animals. And that if we're also going to take a more materialist trend to suggest that things that regulate behavior uh, are really just things happening in the nervous system, then what that's really causing to happen is that it's, it's putting psychology within the domain of biology, that the study of behavior is really brain and behavior, and that it's all the biological adaptive stuff. And, and of course, that's an end to the kind of Cartesian mind-body dualism when we take the brain, or we, sorry, we take the mind away from that special uh, uh, ghostly kind of definition and we place it into the, into the brain and the body as, as a form of neuroscience. And then, of course, that connects us with other animals as well, basically saying that the principles of behavior are governed by the nervous system and because it's functionally, uh, structurally uh, 
the same in humans as it is in most other animals, maybe with degrees of, of uh, complexity being a difference, but at its core fundamental levels, you know, functionally the same kind of system, then you have this kind of continuity. So now what this is important here is that prior to this kind of Darwinian twist in its influence on, on psychology in the late 1800s, it was not considered acceptable to, to, to think about human behavior and the human mind and animal behavior as if they would be considered relevant, relative to each other at all. But now we can do that and we can have what we would call comparative psychology, which means that if we're gonna, we can study animal behavior and the things we learn about animal behavior can then be generalized to human behavior. Comparative, broadly speaking, just means drawing comparisons across any species, but that important divide was whether it's ever possible or legitimate to compare any other animal species to a human. And, and now we finally get people willing to make this claim. And so it becomes very popular then in the 1800s to start doing exactly that, of studying animal behavior and then trying to understand it from the same perspective that we would study and understand human behavior. But what remains here, are one of our earliest uh, animal researchers is doing is a little bit backwards. So I previously described comparative psychology as studying animal behavior and then trying to draw a conclusion from that to a, something about, to say something about human behavior. But Romains is doing the opposite. He's taking a, a, an understanding of human behavior and then applying that to animals, which is still uh, perhaps a legitimate thing to do. It falls within the heading of comparative psychology, but what we're seeing here is that ro what Romains has done is quite a bit unscientific. He's effectively anthropomorphizing animals. The famous uh, story, these anecdotes that he used, right? So that's obviously unscientific to, to start with of reasoning based on individual anecdotes is to observe individual cases, the, the story that's most famous is the example of, of cats that he observed fighting, house cats that were fighting. So he had these house cats, they were fighting, they were separated. And then hours later, he observed that one of the cats in the house was hiding under a table in a room all by itself. And then the other cat that he had previously been in a fight with just walks into the room, apparently oblivious to the, the cat that's under the table hiding. And then the cat that was hiding sees the other cat walk in the room, jumps out and attacks and they start fighting all over again. And Romains observing this reached the conclusion that the cat that was hiding under the table was in fact waiting in ambush. It was plotting its revenge and, and, and still angry over the previous encounter. And now that it had seen the, the other cat walk in oblivious to its presence, took that opportunity to ambush and attack and, you know, get revenge for the previous wrongs that were, that were imposed on it. So uh, obviously there's a lot of uh, unnecessary explanatory uh, uh, stuff happening with Romains, right? That he's attributing all of these kinds of plotting and revenge and hurt feelings and all of this stuff to explain the cat's behavior when maybe we don't need to invoke all of that kind of stuff, right? Maybe we can explain it in a more simpler Maybe even what we might think of, going back to with, with Descartes, the stimulus response kind of explanation that the cat was not plotting or wasn't thinking about anything, but the moment it saw the other cat, that was a trigger, right? And it's a stimulus that activates the response automatically without any plotting, planning, hurt feelings, or any of that kind of stuff, just an automatic stimulus response. Another example that uh, something that Romains didn't use, but one that we could uh, use to understand the nature of, of how unscientific Romains was being. Imagine an animal that learns how to open a door in your house, dog or cat or whatever. They learn how to push open doors. Maybe even dogs might learn how to, to, to stand up on their hind legs and, and press against a lever on certain kinds of doors, right? That might open that up. And if a dog was able to do that, we wouldn't necessarily need to say that the dog has learned how doorknobs work, right? That we wouldn't need to invoke that they have some understanding that pushing down on the lever causes the bolt to retract and that frees open the door with, you know, all this kind of stuff, this mechanical understanding of, of doors, right? Dogs doesn't need to have a mechanical understanding of, of a door to be able to figure it out, right? They just have to learn that if I do this, this other thing happens. If I push this lever, the door opens. It's a stimulus response you know, immediate consequence of your, 
cons consequence of your action effect here. So in that situation, we're, we don't need necessarily to invoke this higher level reasoning and planning and emotional, all of the stuff that Romains is doing to explain animals' behaviors in the world. And so his own student, C. Lloyd Morgan here, is one of the first to make this uh, entire argument that um, we don't need to invoke this. But instead of just making the argument that we should always use a simple stimulus response kind of claim, what Morgan does is he, he gives us this kind of a guideline for interpreting animal behavior, and it comes to be known as Morgan's canon. And so he says that in order to be scientific, what we should do is we should always use the simplest possible explanation of behavior. So in order to understand this, he says that we should think of a, a continuum of behavior, a spectrum of, of behavior. So you could have very simplistic reflex-like stimulus response behavior at the very bottom, and think of it like a ladder or as a hierarchy. And at the bottom of the ladder, you have the very sim most simplest possible uh, explanation of behavior in terms of a totally mindless stimulus response reflex. At the top of the ladder, you would have much more complex behavior, things that maybe do require us to invoke some complex psychological process, such as reasoning and, 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 and planning and forethought and, and emo emotion and various things like that. And that, but that we would allow for a whole kind of range of, of complexity in between those two extremes, right? So you have the simplest, least complex and the most complex explanation at the top and then some variation between those in between. And so now that if we, are, if we think about it in that terms of that continuum, what Morgan's canon is suggesting is that we should not go up the ladder to higher levels, more complex explanations, unless we absolutely have to. That is, if the stimulus response or the simplest levels are not working to explain the behavior, then it would be scientifically valid to, to go up the ladder a little bit and then invoke a little bit more of cognitive complexity or reasoning complexity in order to to explain the behavior, but you only go up as much as you, you have to, right? You don't just go all the way, jump all the way to the top of the ladder, right? You work your way up gradually is the basic idea. So, so that's what Morgan's Canon is all about here, but then we, this leads to a debate, and this is a debate within biology more so than psychology. And so the two characters here, Loeb and Jennings, uh, and let's just jump to the next slide because I got this little compare contrast between Loeb and Jennings, who are both animal biologists and they're studying animal behavior. Loeb uh, is of a mind that we never need to climb the so-called metaphorical ladder of Morgan's canon, right? That, that we can stay at the bottom and always use a stimulus response explanation to explain behavior. But Jennings, on the other hand, is saying, no, we do need to sometimes climb the ladder. We do need to invoke more mental psychological processes to explain things. So, as an example of what Loeb is talking about here, Loeb was, was known for studying reflexes, specifically a form of reflexes called tropisms, which are, uh, tropos refers to light, right? So these are light uh, activated reflexes. Classic example is the moth that flies towards the flame, right? Now in explaining what the moth is doing, we don't need to invoke something like uh, uh, any kind of a psychological process in the moth, right? Is the moth aware that it's trying to get to the flame? Does the moth want something? Does it desire the flame or the light? Do, do we need to invoke any of that kind of stuff? Intention, planning, desire, goals to explain the fact that the moth would be flying towards the light. I think clearly the answer is probably not, right? We could imagine, maybe this is a little advanced compared to Loeb's understanding of the nervous system, but we could potentially imagine from our perspective now that uh, a pattern of light distribution within the, the compound eyes of the moth might activate a, a series of, of neural circuits in the, in the moth's nervous system that would, that would cause one wing to beat a little bit more than the other, which would steer, steer the moth in one direction, right? So based on a, a pattern of light distribution within the eyes, that would cause steering in one way and then another and then another, and eventually the moth would steer itself towards the light without any kind of goal needing to be uh, invoked at a conscious level for the moth, right? Of course, what's also important to realize is that Lo as Loeb is studying tropisms, another example, very important example for tropisms is the fact that plants, a house plant placed in a window, will grow towards the light. 
a sunflower will, will point at the sun throughout the course of the day. And we do not need to invoke, obviously I should hope, in any kind of planning or goal or, or reasoning process when it comes to explaining uh, plants doing that. And plants don't even have a nervous system, right? They have a, maybe some sort of a vascular system where water is flowing through that, that causes the, the stems to bend a certain way. But this is not something we, we would expect to, to talk about with regard to invoking um, planning, right? Any kind of mental or psychological process at all. So what Loeb is suggesting here is that if we can have what we would consider to be goal-directed behavior, and, and that is kind of what we're talking about here, right? There is a, a goal in a way. Uh, plants do need the light for photosynthesis, so we would say that is a goal-directed behavior, but we can have that without the plant being consciously aware of its goals, and therefore without those goals playing any sort of a direct role in the mental control of, of the behavior. So Loeb says we don't need that stuff. We don't need this mentalistic side of, uh, of, of things to explain the fact that animals can, or plants can achieve any kind of, of goal-directed action. Jennings, on the other hand, notes that not all behavior is so simplistic and reflexive. And you know, just to get that simple stimulus followed by a response in a very fixed way. Jennings notes that animals are capable of learning, even sometimes simple animals. He was famous for studying amoebas and, and the fact that they can learn to respond in different ways. And so he's suggesting here that, um, and, and of course amoebas don't really have a nervous system in the way we would think of it with a multicellular vertebrate kind of animal, right? So he's, he, he's, he's you know, invoking the idea that you have to have some kind of complexity at a mentalistic level to explain learning because reflexes are fixed. And for a reflex to change as a function of experience requires us to invoke some kind of a mentalistic process to be involved in that learning. So on the one side, what we have with Loeb is we have what is hopefully obviously a precursor to the behavioristic way of thinking. Everything is reducible to simple reflexive stimulus response actions. Whereas what Jennings is talking about is pretty similar to what the functionalist of the previous chapter, chapter 12, were talking about, that we would need something like the SOR chain, right? So you've got the stimulus and the response, but in between them, you have some kind of a psychological process that, that mediates the responding. And that means perhaps storing the learning and, and, and mediating in the learning process. Whereas Loeb says, you know, you just go straight from S to R with no mediating a mind, right? We have some other examples of functionalist animal psychology. So Thorndike was a, was a standard functional psychologist uh, influenced by people like Dewey and, and Angel and Carr and others from chapter 12. And, but he's famous for, for you know, his, his own study here of what we now call the law of effect, right? So, so with Thorndike, he's studying the fact that animals can learn the consequences of their actions. And he invented this contraption here, the puzzle box. He places cats inside the puzzle box, and the cat has to be able to perform a particular response in order to escape. And so you can see in here, there's a trap door, and the door can be activated. There's a, a little fob hanging on a string inside there, and you know cats doing kind of cat-like things might do something like uh, swipe at the fob and pull on it, and, and, and if the cat does so, that might will retract a bolt and allow the trap door to open. Other versions of the puzzle box would have a maybe a lever and cats also rub up against things so if the cat rubbed up against the lever just right that might also pull the string and release the trap door and then what Thorndike would do is if the cat manages to successfully open the door he would pick him up and put it right back in the box and, and wait to see if the cat was likely to repeat that action and that's in fact exactly what Thorndike has observed, that the cat is more likely, once they discover the response that opens the door, and then you put them back in the box, they're more likely to repeat that response again. Uh, and what we're also focusing on though here is that the cat is not just learning the consequence of its action and it's learning how to get out of the box, but it's, it's learning based on what he calls reward. The cat wants to get out of the box. This is something that we don't often talk about when we talk about Thorndike's work is that Thorndike would actually starve these cats for three or four days before putting them in the box. And then he'd put them in the box and then there's a bowl of food 
outside the box. So the cat really wants to get out of the box. And then when the cat manages to figure out how to get out, and instead of letting them eat, Thorndike would put them right back in the box again to see if now that they are figured it out, if now that they're motivated by hunger, they would want to really try to figure it out again and get out. So now, of course, they're seeing that they are more likely to, to escape the box faster the second time, the third time, the fourth time, right? They, 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 they finally figure it out. So Thorndike's argument here is that this learning process is mediated by the fact that they are trying to get what they want. They desire the food and their, 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 their uh, behavior is mediated by this need, this desire, right? And that's the definition of a, re of a reward in Thorndike's law of effect is the cat has a goal. A cat wants something and it's aware that it wants something and it's going to try to figure out how to get it what it wants. So this is classic functionalism with like Harvey Carr's adaptive act, right? You have the motivating stimulus. In this case, there's the hunger. And so that's in the mind of the cat. And this is the SOR chain. Anything that doesn't lead to the reward is not going to be repeated, but anything that does lead to a reward is more likely to be repeated. It's called the law of effect. This is not always explained either. Why is it called the law of effect? Because the animals are learning cause and effect, right? They learn that if I do X, then I get Y. X causes Y. And so they're learning about these causal relationships as well. That's another thing that maybe we don't need to, just like I talked about with, uh, with uh, dogs learning to open doors, they're learning cause and effect, right? Another functional animal psychologist was Robert Yerkes at Yale University, and he is famous for having discovered this so-called Yerkes-Dodson law or curve, the inverted U-shape relation between arousal and, and, and performance. This is something of a, um, perhaps a myth really. So, so, so it has been told in this way for, for a, a century now, Although recent papers have been pointing out the fact that uh, it doesn't really quite look exactly like this, but at least it's a common sense way, an intuitive way of understanding what Yerkes was doing and his student Dotson, which is the idea that there is an optimal ar arousal level for performance, right? So too little arousal causes you to be very drowsy and, uh, and, and sluggish, so you're not going to have high levels of performance. But as you increase arousal, performance goes up, but if you, you hit a point where you might uh, have too much, right? And too much arousal leads to stress and a decline in, in functioning and activity. So there's this optimal idea here, but this is considered a functionalist approach because the idea is that he's describing arousal at the level of mental and psychological arousal, right? Wakefulness, conscious, you know, conscious uh, processes. So this is early functional uh, psychology, but as we also talked about at the end of the chapter 12, there were some problems with the, the, the nature of some of the, some of the hinting of mind-body issues going on here. There's a little dualism with their mental stuff uh, that they talk about in ways that are separate from the body stuff in all this functional psychology. So we now need to get to behaviorism. And behaviorism is going to point out the, the ways in which we might try to be a little more scientific while studying animal behavior. And of course, famously starts with this guy Pavlov, in a way, because he was not a psychologist, really. He's a, he's a physiologist. He's a surgeon, and he's studying digestive physiology in dogs. Um, and he wants to understand the neuroscience of it. We know that there's the, you've got the vagus nerve. You've got all these nerves that innervate the whole gut. And, and so he's trying to figure out how it all works and how it's all wi wired together, how things are regulated and how it all interacts. But so he's not necessarily interested in the mental control of this stuff, right? He, you know, he doesn't, he thinks psychology in this era is highly unscientific. So he doesn't really even want to be associated with it, which is a bit of a historical irony considering. But, you know, so just a brief overview of what he's doing at the digestive level. We don't need to worry too much about all this stuff. It's really, that's a, it's a topic for digestive physiology, not a psychology class, but he's studying, you know, he wants to understand the nervous regulation of things like uh, the production of, of salivation in the mouth and then also gastric secretions in the stomach. Now, we know that it makes some sense that as soon as you put food in the mouth, the saliva glands begin to produce saliva. So there's a simple stimulus response explanation for that. But he also wanted to know what's the stimulus response relationship for the gastric secretions in the stomach. It might make some sense, for example, to think that, okay, food in the mouth means salivation. And so then 
you, the dog will swallow the food and then food in the stomach will trigger gastric secretions. But it's not enough to simply assume that because it's also possible that Pavlov was concerned, maybe, maybe there's a, a trigger there in the mouth that, is, that food in the mouth not only triggers salivation, but maybe the nerve signal also then travels ahead to the stomach and causes the stomach to start producing gastric secretions in advance of swallowing, right? Uh, or maybe there's some process during the swallowing, you know, some stimulation of the esophagus trigger is a, is a stimulus that sends ahead a, a signal to the stomach, right? So in order to do this, he had to invent all of these complex um, uh, surgical things to, to be able to do what he called the sham feeding procedure, which is it's difficult to, to, to trigger, uh, figure out, you know, what's the actual trigger for the gastric secretions? Is it food in the mouth or is it food in the stomach? Because it all happens pretty quickly. So the sham free feeding procedure, what he did was he disconnected the esophagus from the stomach so that when the dogs would swallow the food, it never makes it to their stomach. And then he would be then questioning, does the, does the stomach still produce gastric secretions uh, anyway? And so he's collecting the food, you know, he attaches the, the, the esophagus to the abdominal wall so that they swallow the food and it comes out the pouch, but he also has a, a shunt inserted to, to be able to extract secretions from the stomach and collect and measure that to see how, how much and when does the stomach produce those gastric enzymes. And that's, of course, what he found is that even when the dogs are swallowing the food, but it just makes it uh, come out the pouch and never gets to the stomach, that the stomach is still producing those enzymes. And he's showing then that there is, in fact, a signal that's kind of going ahead in advance from the mouth or the esophagus. And of course, he then identifies that's part of the role of the vagus nerve, which is part of the autonomic parasympathetic nervous system here in regulating the digestive processes. And of course, that in and of itself was, was a big, big deal. And that's what he won the Nobel Prize for. But at the same time, we also have the discoveries that he, he eventually started becoming more famous for, which was the fact that he noticed that the dogs would start salivating, not just when he put food in their mouth, but also when the, the laboratory assistant, whose job was to give them the food, walked into the room. And, you know, the initial conclusion from this might be is that if the dogs saw that person, that maybe the dogs somehow were aware that that was the person who fed them. And by recognizing them, they know they're about to be fed. And then that causes them to salivate in advance. But what we're doing, if we, if we do that, and we might call this, as Pavlov did, a psychical reflex. The idea is that now this psychological knowledge that the dogs have gets in, involved in the reflex, what would normally be the reflexive response of salivation. But if we, if we do this, if we start invoking the mind in this kind of process, we're climbing the ladder of Morgan's Cannon, right? We're starting to invoke this high level stuff. And that's of course exactly what Jennings was talking about when he said that whenever you take a, a reflex and you talk about learning, so now the, you've gone beyond the reflex. You have to start invoking more mental stuff to explain changes in behavior because reflexes are not allowed to change according to the old Jen Jennings view. But this is where Pavlov's discovery is important because he's showing, here's just a picture of, of, of the whole apparatus of, of, of him collecting the saliva and, and, and recording the variation in its levels over time. But here's where uh, Pavlov's discovery is important because what he's showing is that you can talk about reflexes changing over time without invoking the mind, without invoking some sort of mentalistic process. So again, can, can we stay down at the bottom of the ladder of Morgan's canon? Can we, can we not talk about the mind and still explain behavior? And if we can, then according to Morgan's canon, then that's more scientific to do, to do this, right? So, Pavlov calls this now, he calls it actually, I've got the slide titled a conditioned reflex, but that's actually based on a mistranslation. He called it a conditional reflex because his argument is that the dogs are learning about the conditional relationship between two stimuli. Those two stimuli, of course, meaning the, the person who feeds them and the food as, to, as the two stimuli. And that there's a conditional relationship and the dog has formed an association between them. But in order to eliminate this idea this possible explanation that, that the dog knows something, 
right? The dog knows that this person is feeding them. That's the, that's the person's job, right? And um, so what Pavlov decides to do is to use a completely arbitrary stimulus that has no direct role in the dogs being fed. And this is where we get the famous, uh, not a bell, actually. Um, that's a funny myth. Pavlov never, ever once used a bell. He used a metronome click. In some experiments, he also used tuning forks. Um, but, for the, but for the original discovery, it was a metronome clicking. And so what Pavlov was doing is giving that the metronome click was something that occurs just before he gives them food, but it actually plays no actual role in the, the, the dog being fed. There would be no reason for the dog, if, it, if we're gonna invoke this mentalistic stuff, there would be no reason for the dog to think, oh, that food, that, that click is, 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 is feeding me in any way. So of course we know the answer here is, which is that when Pavlov does this experiment, he finds that this completely arbitrary or neutral st stimulus that would ordinarily have no effect on the dog's behaviors, eventually with uh, repetition begins to evoke the salivation. So using the terminology that we nowadays used uh, based on this idea of conditional learning, um, we get these terms, right? We get the idea that food began as an unconditional or unconditioned stimulus, meaning that the dog doesn't have to learn based on conditional relationships that they should salivate. This is just a reflexive action of the parasympathetic nervous system, right? So food is the unconditioned stimulus and salivation is the unconditioned response. The metronome click began as a neutral stimulus, right? It has no effect, no, no particular response coming from the dog. But after you pair it sufficient, with a sufficient number of pairings with the unconditioned stimulus, then it's no longer neutral, right? It becomes a conditioned stimulus and presenting the conditioned stimulus of the metronome click by itself then is sufficient to elicit the response, which is now a conditional or conditioned response. Sorry, so salivation goes from being an unconditioned response to a conditioned response. So in this way, what, what Pavlov has done is he's, he's, he's really given us a way in which we can explain learning as just a modification of a reflex so that it's triggered by a new stimulus instead of the original unconditioned stimulus. And we do not have to invoke any kind of a psychological process. We don't have to climb Morgan's cannon, the ladder of Morgan's cannon, right? We could keep it at the level of stimulus response. And that's the crucial insight here, right? And that's, the, that's really one of the major, what we might consider a death blow to functional psychology, which is we don't need the O in the SOR chain anymore. We can keep it at the S and the R and still explain learning. And so we get behaviorism from that. A few other things that Pavlov has given us here is there's some importance here about the conditional relationship between the condition and the unconditioned stimulus. The conditional stimulus has to come first. And it's not a permanent change, right? So learning is not permanent here. If you, if you, if you create a conditioned response, uh, it doesn't last forever. So if you continue to present the conditioned stimulus without the unconditioned stimulus for a long period of time, eventually the conditioned response will extinguish. It just goes away, right? So this process is called extinction. So you can keep it active, though, if you at least occasionally have a pairing of the condition and the unconditioned stimulus. But the real importance here is that it sets us up for behaviorism. And so behaviorism here is the idea that we want to do, uh, well, really a lot of things. But the core of it here is to be as scientific in psychology as we possibly can. And because it, what we, our previous definition of science is positivism, right? If you remember all the way back to chapter five, we've talked about positivism as a way of defining science in terms of what is objectively observable. And that means more than one person can observe it and agree on those observations, ideally quantifying your observations, and this gives it scientific validity. Anything that is only subjectively, that is individually, personally observable, is not really scientific. And what we saw with the 19th century psychology, a lot of introspection back in chapter eight, right? Totally unscientific because it's not objective at all, right? So that doesn't count as being a scientific approach. But likewise, the functional psychologists, even though they're not trying to be, they're not using introspection as a primary method at all, 
But nevertheless, because they're still invoking psychological constructs that we still can't observe, right? We can't observe, in, in the case of Thorndike's cats, their desire for the food, right? We, we can't observe uh, any of those kinds of things that they might want, their purpose, their goals, their needs, right? We can't observe rewards then. All that we can observe is the fact that the cat in, presented with a stimulus, which is a particular puzzle box, responds in a specific way. So we can observe the stimulus and we can observe the response. So that would be a scientific psychology, having only a stimulus and response. We just need a way in which we can have a stimulus response explanation that is successful. And of course, that's what Pavlov has just done, is he's given us the possibility of eliminating the O from the SOR chain and still being able to successfully explain things like learning. So we get Watson. Watson being now the founder, who was originally trained as a functional psychologist. He studied, for example, rats and mazes. This is a little piece of trivia here that uh, at Clark University, uh, Willard Small was the first to use white rats in psychology, and he, in, he invented the rat in the maze task. And, and Watson, uh, using that task as a functional psychologist, wrote many papers when he talked about animals and learning and the minds of animals and all that kind of stuff, which is a little bit ironic because just a few years later, he writes the famous Behaviorist Manifesto in which he describes psychology as the behaviorist views it, which is the title of the paper, uh, where, where the goal here is not to explain behavior by invoking high level mental processes or psychological processes or any kind of psychological construct like emotion or personality or intelligence or any of those things, those abstractions. He says that the only goal a psychologist should have is to be able to predict and control behavior. It sounds a little sinister, but the basic idea is that in, in, in any psychology experiment, that would be your goal is you, you would have a hypothesis in advance and that's your prediction. And because you're setting up the experiment by controlling the independent variable and all of the other variables of the situation, you're in control of the situation in the experiment. And if you can successfully control a, a, a protocol in a laboratory and successfully predict your subject's reactions in that protocol, you have now met the definition of prediction and control, right? So there's nothing more sinister than just being able to, to do an experiment and having the outcome turn out exactly as you predicted it. Which, of course, then means that there's an implication for free will in psychology, which is that there is none, right? So this would be a very strong deterministic view uh, that the behavior is governed by the situation, right? The, the variables that were manipulated are really the things that control behavior. Those variables we would call the stimulus, and the behavior is the response. So again, of course, we're just going back to having a stimulus and response with no mind in between. So of course, there's no room for free will, especially that Cartesian idea of free will right there in the middle between the S and the R. Watson famously then does some reverse comparative psychology, if you want to call it that. So, so we're, we're doing this idea that uh, he's, we've, well, or maybe it's not reverse comparative psychology, it's just regular comparative psychology. What he's done is he's um, the first to demonstrate Pavlov's now what we now call classical conditioning, Pavlovian conditioning. Watson was the first to demonstrate it in a human being with the famous Little Albert study, right? So you have surely heard of the, of, of the Little Albert study before. The idea is that he's conditioning a fear response. And so his argument here is that these things that we think of as fear, um, these, the, you know, as an emotion, a higher level mental thing, we don't need to invoke that. We can explain it in terms of a conditioned response, a conditioned reflex. Let me jump to the next slide here. Um, I'm going to link to you in web courses a, a video so you can see the video uh, for Little Albert. I'm not going to try and play it within my narrated PowerPoints, but um, the idea is that um, he presents the rat to the child first, and the child has no particular response, just curiosity uh, mainly, but he's not innately afraid of it, right? Um, but what the child does have kind of, I don't want to say innately, but instinctively is, is, is a few reflexes. Humans are born with various reflexes as infants, and one of them is a startle reflex. And there are lots of, lots of things that can initiate, uh, activate or trigger the startle reflex, but one of them is a loud sound. So we would say that that loud sound, which in, in, in Watson's experiment is two metal pipes that he would bang together near the child's head, very unpleasant as you can imagine, 
is the unconditioned stimulus, right? And that's going to trigger the reflex of the startle response, which in part involves uh, crying, right? So the crying here is not necessarily meant to mean emotion. It's just meant to be the startle reflex, right? So loud sound is the unconditioned stimulus and the startle response of crying or fear, if you want to call it that, but that's perhaps not the ideal term, is the unconditioned response. The rat was obviously neutral to start with, but if you pair it, so that you, you, you show the rat, conditioned stimulus has to come first. So you show the rat, then you bang the two pipes, metal pipes together to make a loud bang, and now the child cries. So now you have, you do that, in fact, Watson did that six times, only six times. And then even after six times, now what happens is that the child sees the rat alone and starts crying. And so now the child, or sorry, the rat becomes the conditioned stimulus and the, the startle response comes, becomes a conditioned reaction, a conditioned response, conditioned reflex uh, to the sight of the rat. Watson, Watson also tried to demonstrate that this, this, this startle response, a conditioned response, generalized to other similar stimuli, such as a, a dog and a, and a rabbit and a fur coat and an and a animal mask. Um, the evidence for that perhaps is a little less compelling, but at least the, 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 the key finding that uh, the, the rat goes from being a neutral stimulus to a conditioned stimulus, and that this happens, this kind of Pavlovian learning occurs in humans as well as it does in Pavlov's dogs or is in any other animal species. Uh, shows that the basic mechanisms of learning are the same across species, so an important discovery there for conditional, or sorry, for comparative psychology. But uh, it's also uh, uh, an important thing for human psychology to now suggest that, think, that things that we might think of as deriving our so-called fear reactions to stimuli in the world around us, whether it's spiders or rats or whatever we might be afraid of, could be explainable without invoking any kind of complex psychological processes, right? We could just say it could have been the result of some simple conditional learning uh, experience that happened in our childhood or at any point in life, really, and that that's where our fears come from. And, and so here, for example, Watson had specifically criticized Freud, right? So Freud, we haven't gotten to Freud yet, but if you know enough about Freud, you could imagine, as Watson did, the idea that, that fears of things like this could be explainable in terms of some sort of psychosexual traumas and repressed frustrations and things of that nature that then manifest themselves in these weird metaphorical ways, such as a fear of a rat. Um, but Watson would say that none of that stuff, that's far too convoluted of an argument. And it's all, on, you're climbing Morgan's cannon in ways that are unnecessary. And you don't need to. You could just explain it in simple stimulus response terms that some conditional learning occurred and, and, and previously, and that would explain the, re the reaction. So now the idea, echoing Loeb's argument from a few decades prior, and it's actually important to note that when Watson was a, uh, was a student at the University of Chicago, his biology class was taught by Jacques Loeb. So, so there's a little bit of a direct influence here that must have been ruminating somewhere in the back of Watson's mind that this idea that it would be better if we could explain behavior just in terms of the stimulus response chain. But it wasn't until Watson learned of Pavlov's discovery and applied it himself to, to a human that he was able to then show, yes, this is the way we can do psychology in a scientific way. We can, we can simplify everything and reduce all behavior down to the stimulus response chain. We no longer need to talk about the mind at all. That's a good place to stop it. We're gonna cut this uh, set of notes here into two parts. And so neo-behaviorism is next. But let's not go there yet. Let's just have this as part one, and we'll come back for part two later.